Eric, good, yeah. to, see you. good to have you here. All right. Um, Jerry, are you mining the uh, controls as usual? I'm here. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, could you please call the roll? Steve Chesler? Here. Eric Brzezidis? Here. P. Willis Elkins? Here. Katie Denny Horowitz? Yo Lowe? Trina McKeeva? Here. Janice Peterson? Bella Sable? William Vega? Here. Laura Hoffman? Kevin Custer? Kevin? He's on screen. If he's on screen, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You have a quorum. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, welcome everyone to Environmental Protection Committee meeting here tonight in WebEx. And we have um, uh, two main items. The first one is 470 Kent and their state pollution discharge elimination system permit. And uh, they will speak about that and potentially their post construction uh, management of storm and wastewater. And then, um, so we'll hear your, hear your presentation and then we'll uh, field questions and comments to you. And then um, if we have anything further, if we wanna make a comment to the board, then we'll uh, deliberate about that. And then we'll move on to item two, which is a, a DEC uh, Superfund site at um, 566 Grand Street. So DEC will be uh, presenting about that. And then we'll have updates, new business, old business. And so, um, so I thought, I thought it was good just to um, hear about this, this first project because it's, um, you know, an ongoing um, you know, process that is potentially allowed with waterfront development properties in terms of their remediation and how they're, they are, um, you know, if they're in a dewatering situation and then potentially beyond that, um, like the, the, at the Domino project um, down Kent, they're um, getting a, a, sim a similar uh, permit but it's related to managing stormwater and wastewater on site, essentially treating it um, and I think recycling what they can and then um, discharging what uh, excess and basically trying to take the load off of our existing um, combined sewage and stormwater system. So anyway, I'll let, I'll let uh, 470 Kent um, explain that further. And so I guess we have, um, Matt Carroll, who's representing the developers, and then we have Matt Vigiano. I'm sorry, I've mixed mixed up. Who's with the environmental consultant and Matt Vigiano, who's uh, representing the developers, and we have Rodney, um, who's here from DEC, to um, support what they're doing. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, please take it away. And yeah, if you have a presentation, hopefully you should be able to share your screen. Also, really quick one. This is Kevin Costa. Sorry, I couldn't come off mute, but I'm here. Thanks. Great. Uh, Matt Vigiano, anything you'd like to say before I start the presentation? Um, no, just to say thank you to the chair, Mr. Chesler, um, and the members of the committee for for having us. Um, we this is this is the I think the second time we've come to to the board. Um, we presented to some of the folks here on the waterfront committee previously about our waterfront public access area. Um, and so we're, we're here to uh, walk you through the, the speedies permit and process and um, answer any questions you guys might have. My colleague, Matt Carroll uh, here, um, will walk you through the slides that we have and um, just thank you for the opportunity to speak. Mute it. I'm sorry. I thought I could do the uh, the space bar 
uh, when I was in presentation mode. Uh, so uh, again, my name is uh, Matt Carroll. I'm a professional engineer, and um, in this capacity, working as the remedial engineer on the 470 uh, Kent Avenue project. And as part of the um, uh, as part as part of the work, um, as the chair alluded to, there will be uh, construction dewatering. Um, and so uh, I wanted to um, present two main items. One is just a, a general overview of what the system would be like, um, and then also how this ties into DEC and uh, why we would be um, asking for a speedies permit. Um, so, so, you know, a little bit of background on the, you know, on the, the purpose of the construction dewatering, but this would be a a typical system that um, that's been implemented up and down uh, Kent Avenue and throughout uh, New York City. And generally, there are several well points uh, established around the area that is going to be dewatered. That water is collected and then treated and then discharged off site. And that's the general approach for construction dewatering. In this scenario, uh, the water will be treated so it meets the DEC limits to discharge to surface water, which is the uh, is is the uh, preferred method in New York City because then that water isn't routed to a treatment plant and needs to be treated. Um, I know there was a reference to Domino, and that's not a project I'm working on, but a, a similar concept is to the chair had uh, had indicated that it's to minimize. The amount of water that gets treated through any DEP facilities. So that's how this gets sent out to uh, surface water directed uh, directly. Uh, this site is um, a state brownfield, and there is a permitting process that could go through the brownfield. Uh, in this instance, it was determined that the dewatering was not considered a remedial component. And so we are doing a straightforward construction speedies DEC application. And as you may or may not know, this uh, census tract is designated as a potential environmental justice area. So there are public participation requirements. Um, so I'll present the main items that are in the speedies and in the in the PPP, as we call it. But also, um, you'll see at the end, um, there'll be some information about another public meeting that we'll be holding. Um, and I know Matt Vigiona had reached out to uh, identify a date, and it's going to be held on May 11th. Uh, so, as I alluded to, uh, this is the general idea of the system and we'll provide a figure on the, um, on the, on the next, uh, the next page, but it's collected through a series of well points. It's treated through a system and I'll describe that in more detail. And then for this specific site, the discharge is going to be under division Avenue, uh, where there is an existing DEP owned outfall. Uh, there is a regulator under division Avenue as well. Um, and we will be after that system, so it will be a direct discharge into uh, into Wallabat Channel, the East River. So the the system, as I alluded to, is fairly straightforward for the treatment, and that it's first the water is is filtered um, and settled, so it drops out the sediment. So you so there's no turbidity in the soil and the water that would be discharged. Um, that sediment is captured, held on site. At the end of the system will be characterized and disposed off site. The, uh, the groundwater that then is, you know, has the sediment dropped out flows through 2 large carbon vessels. Um, these are grant filled with granular activated carbon. Um, and basically that's a way to pull out, uh, any volatiles that might be, um, that might be in the groundwater. Similarly, at the end of the project, that carbon is, um. Actually, at this point, it's very expensive, so it's going to be, it'll be recharged. It'll be sent to a disposal facility and then reused um, in the future. Uh, one of the points that I wanted to make at the end is, um, you know, if you do take a, the opportunity to review the speedies, um, that in the final approval from DEC, uh, they will set the limits. So we ensure water quality uh, is met and that we will have requirements included in the permit to test uh, both at system startup. Um, and then they'll also provide a frequency going forward. Typically that's on a quarterly basis and we have to provide those 
results to the department to ensure that the water quality uh, requirements are met throughout the throughout the process. And if you've looked at other dewatering projects that go to the city, it would be, it would be similar. So it's very similar to what DEP requires, DEC will require on this site as well. Uh, here's a general outline of what the system is. That'll initially be uh, uh, the, the lighter colored uh, first phase it will be this, where the well points are, um, are installed. In a later phase, the, the blue darker colored will be um, will be installed um, somewhere along Walbot Channel. We'll uh, we'll have all of the infrastructure for uh, for the water treatment, and then you can see there's going to be a direct discharge approved by DEP to Division Avenue, where there's the big interceptor sewer, and then it goes out the outfall to to surface water. Um, Way there, excuse me. Uh, as I alluded to, because of the potential environmental justice area that's uh, that's coded onto this site, there's a public participation process. Um, this is part of that outreach, and we're thankful for the opportunity to uh, present in front of the committee this evening. Um, and this is codified in a public participation plan, the PPP, that was approved by DEC, and the general. General components that we're going to run through are to set up a public meeting. I'll give you the details for that shortly. Uh, there's a document repository. The details will also be shared in this presentation where you um, are free to look at the PPP and also a copy of the draft speedies that's under review by DEC. Um, intermittently through the project, we will be providing progress updates to the department. You know, for example, describing what uh, what fact sheets have been sent out. That we've made outreach to uh, the environmental protection committee um, and then at the end we will provide a final report and certification that we have followed the public participation requirements of as you can see the reference here the commissioner policy 29 which is environmental justice and permitting so we'll we'll do a final certification to show that we've implemented all of these steps oh my goodness as i alluded to uh, we hope that you can come to our virtual meeting um, it's be held on May 11th uh, from 6 to 8. It'll, you know, we'll keep it open, but, you know, let's say by 6.15, we'll have allowed every, you know, gotten everyone on board and we'll start a, a similar presentation for this evening. Um, there is a Zoom link where you are encouraged to sign up, though it is not a requirement of the, the program. You can join at any time. Um, and obviously you're available to, uh, to call in as well. Um, Lastly, as I alluded to, there is an online document re repository, kentspeedies.com, and that has all of the uh, latest and reviewed documents by the department. And um, you can also contact me directly. That's also in the PPP. Um, so if you have any questions or comments after this meeting, something comes to you, feel free to reach out. Um, DEC also periodically um, does updates on their website. Um, and you can see through that application ID how to be able to uh, to track that. Um, that is our general overview of the construction dewatering and our public participation plan. Um, I said I hope that you can join us. And if anyone has any initial comments on the construction dewatering, I'd be happy to uh, answer them or take the comment to get back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um... Matt? I'll just put this back up if, uh, if that's helpful. Okay. Yeah, so you just give a summary of what um, substances will be um, treated in the water, like you mentioned, volatiles. Um, sure. Which ones they are, if there's a petroleum sure. type of substance or PFOs or PFAs. Uh, absolutely, be happy to. So you've alluded to the, or referenced the, um, the compounds that you most frequently see dissolved in the groundwater. Uh, the, the, the PFOAs at our site are, and 1,4-dioxane are below drinking water standards. So those have not been a contaminant of concern. Uh, the, uh, the dissolved volatiles uh, mainly on site are BTEX, which would be petroleum related. That's benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylenes. Um, they're generally at what we call low concentrations that you know, they need to be treated um, 
before discharge, but you know, at the site, there's not a heavy contamination that would require remediation as, um, uh, you know, so they're over drinking water standards, but no one drinks the water here is kind of the, the concept. So they're there and before you discharge them to the sewer uh, or to surface water, they need to be, um, they need to be treated. Um, there are on the northern portion of the site, more on the semi volatiles um, are, are still in the dissolved phase. Um, those are most likely related to the um, to the historic fill that's uh, that's more present on the, the northern portion. And as you get towards the surface water, um, there are uh, more metals in the dissolved phase that would be above. Again, we're all compared to drinking water standards, very you know low levels. Those aren't, um, so, but it's mainly saline related. So the treatment system isn't um, to the extent that will settle out sediment, but not treating the metals because they're consistent with what the surface water concentrations are. But all of the, um, the, the characterization of the water here meets what we typically call full scan or full TAL TCL plus 30. So all of, and plus the, the PFOAs. So everything that's been required under DEC remedial programs have been tested uh, across several rounds in this site. And those final discharge limits will be set by, by the department. Okay, so just to confirm the saying that the carbon filter will not filter out the um, semi volatiles. The, and then... uh, right, those, those will be those will be treated through the well. I mean, I'll be I'll be real clear about this one. The semi volatiles are mainly in the, the soil uh, particles, so, which will drop out through the filter. Um, there are some petroleum related. Um, SVOCs, uh, the big one is naphthalene, um, so that that will be treated by the uh, by the carbon filters. So the, the petroleum related SVOCs are, are are treated through the carbon, and the historic fill related SVOCs are mainly related you know, will be through the um, well, there's there's two there's a settling tank and then a filtering system. All right, uh, thanks. Um, any committee members have comments or questions for Matt? Yes, I do. It's Laura. Um, I just visited speed, the speedies.com link and mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask if you could correct the links or dead links that are there. Um, uh, they're not live links. You, you have to cut and paste them into the browser. So if that could be fixed, that would be helpful. Great. I'm going to check that on my end. Uh, I see exactly what you're saying, Laura. I uh, I appreciate that. We'll get those. Uh, we'll get those into the uh, the HTML settings. Thank you very much. I obviously we, we see it on the uh, on the publishing side. And um, when I updated these, I must not have checked the the live website. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Anyone, any, is it anyone from general public who has a comment or question? Or 470? Okay. Um, and can you say anything about the, um, the development plans as far as post construction management of? Wastewater and stormwater. Um, I can talk about stormwater because that's within my uh, my, my purview. Um, but I'm I'm not exactly aware of um, of any. Uh, I'm assuming this you know the septic was is going out under approved DEP. But generally, um, there there's a, a stormwater pollution prevention plan that be in place for this project that has uh, both storing construction elements. Um, but on the post construction, generally there's something that's called a hydrodynamic separator, an HDS, um, and that's you know similar to um, the con or the concept that I was talking about earlier is that discharging to surface water is the preferred methodology uh, for groundwater where you are able to that both um, you know DEP does not want the water to go to the infrastructure. It's the same concept for the um, uh, the post remediation. Uh, sorry, it's the post-construction stormwater 
for uh, for this site is that there will, will be a, a an outfall that'll be permitted by by DEC in order to collect treat and discharge the stormwater into all of that channel. And the, the HDS is basically a combined system that uh, addresses again uh, turbidity, floatables, uh, napple, uh, you know, some petroleum. You know, if there's any petroleum gets mixed into it. So this system is um, again, you know, pretty much not reinventing the wheel for this project. That's uh, what you'll see as uh, you know, the, the typical selected approach for discharge to. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's called. This is a fourth order uh, water body, um, uh, which doesn't require any. Um, uh, any stormwater controls other than to uh, manage it and discharge it to to a large water system. Or will the the building be um, managing wastewater at all from the building? Well, to, to, the, to the extent that there's definitely wastewater, but I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm sorry that's not that's not permitted okay. for me as the remedial engineer. So I don't have uh, I don't want to speak out of out of turn. But um, you know, I just would there's say no, everything. There's no gray done. water capture. Uh, contemplated as part of the post construction building systems, um, Mr. Chair. Okay, that's uh, good to hear. Um, and then related to the yeah the post construction release of stormwater, what will the I guess the outflow point I guess look like? Because I I, I, mem I remember the waterfront public access area design and I know it's essentially a you know a um you know a straight edge. You know there's I don't remember there being a soft water's edge, which is a shame. I think we prefer that. But anyway, I just want to just check in about the interaction between uh people who are on the you know on the uh, accessing the the access area and the um discharge point. Right. Um I think this is something that um, it, it, it would be, uh, you know, a, a, an outfall uh, through the bulkhead. Um, so um, nothing, uh, you know, so I would say similar to to most outfalls that are along the the waterfront in Kent. Um, sorry, I don't uh, I don't know the interaction with the, uh, the public shore walkway, but that's something I can uh, can inquire about. Okay. All right. Um... Anyone else have comments or questions about this problem? Willis, sorry to hear. Oh, yeah. Uh, no problem. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, uh, oh, so the question was about the outfall. Are you, you're creating, you said you're creating a new outfall for the, where the speedies discharge is going to be? Um, uh, it will be the speedies discharge for the construction due watering is through an existing outfall that's owned by DEP, and it, that right. is at the foot of Division Avenue, so it's already existing. So to be clear, so that's a that's a CSO, right? That's there. Uh, yes, I think that that it ties. You know, farther up is is the regulator, so it could work as a CSO. Right, so it discharge just to be clear. So it's discharging into the CSO pipe, but between on the other side of the of the regulator. That's that's correct. It's on the other side of okay. the regulator. Yep. So I guess my my question is like, there's signage at every CSO, including this one at Division, that mm -hmm. say if you see a discharge during warm weather, call this number. Is there going to be like an additional signage here to clarify, or how? Here's a, here's a, Here's a separate question as well. Like, how will someone know? Because I've actually reported dry weather discharge from the CSO before, and DP has gone and checked it out. So, how would anybody be able to know whether discharge coming out of this, if it's the same pipe, is from is the treated groundwater from your site, or is a malfunction of the CSO? Yep, that's uh. I understand what you um, are asking. I don't know if DEC will require any change <clears throat> in the signage on the CSO outfall. Um, you know, our our requirement was to <clears throat> excuse me to to notify them and um, identify what the DEP outfall is. Um, once again, I can I can ask for more information on that and have it for the for the public meeting or share it through through Matt Vigiano. Um, 
but I, I don't know if there'll be a requirement from DDC to change that. Obviously they're, they're tracking the outfall. So if there are any calls, they know that it's, um, that it is where the construction dewatering is, uh, is occurring. Right. I, I don't, I mean, is anyone, update. yeah, is anyone from DEC or DEP on the call to help answer this? I mean, cause you understand the concern is that like anybody will see the sign and be like, oh, there's dry, there's dry weather discharge and then call the number and potentially it's a waste of everyone's time or potentially the discharge is obscuring of malfunction of the CSO. Great. Well, I know that Rodney is on the phone, but this was not his, uh, the project he was presenting on. If uh, I'll give that opportunity, but otherwise I will, um, I will request that from the DEC permits group to see if they have anything that can help uh, explain how they track that. Yeah, I myself am not familiar exactly with that, Willis, but um, I mean, you, you can shoot me an email just to remind me. Um, and I'll not only discuss with permits, but it may be be better question to ask to our water staff. Okay, and is it solely a DEC issue or does DEP have, because DEP is going to be the one responding, right, to any complaint, any 311 calls? Yeah, that, that D, DEC and DEP are, you know, coordinated that there is a, you know, a notification requirement to the city as well. So they'll be aware of the discharge, but again, I can, I can see if, what uh, if permits can find out any more or provide us with more information about how that works on, uh, on their end. Uh, our requirement is just to, uh, to mail them the notifications, which we've done. You know, okay, DEP cool. may also have, well, DEP may also have a system in place to determine um, situations like that. So you might, you might want to run that question by them also. Okay. Uh, if it's possible for you all to, to, to investigate and, and maybe follow up with the environmental committee, that would, I think would be appreciated. It seems like, uh, you know, a concern that shouldn't, the burden shouldn't be on us to sort of investigate. Yeah, please. Up. I would appreciate it if, uh, Matt, if, uh, no worries. try and find that out and yeah, uh, communicate back hey, with good myself and, and I'm, board. I'm Sadiq Ahmed. From yep. the DC. Yeah, yeah, we're still dealing with that. item one, Sadiq. Um, uh, Wait, do you have an answer, Sadiq? Where are you sorry. on oh. the question? Yeah, uh, just no. I, I just joined the meeting. Okay. So I'm not sure with that. Uh, so let's not put the question you maybe didn't hear to you. Uh, we can track that down yeah. and follow up. Okay. Yeah. I would appreciate that. Thank uh, you. That's uh, on one of our lists of items that we'll we'll provide a. Uh, more information on to the to the committee. Great. Um, let me see if anyone else. Uh, I had one more question. Real quick, sorry, please. Sure. Oh, well, just about the. Uh, I realize this might be a little outside the scope of the project, but the um, we talked about the the waterfront design for the parcel. Are there any investments being made by the developer in improving the the street end of Division Avenue? Um, I think like the sort of reoccurring issue, I mean, one is that it's in pretty bad shape as it is, and it would actually benefit the developer to have the street end, you know, almost like fit in with the continuation of the landscaping that's happening. But also, you know, given that you're, you know, there's a utilization of city infrastructure at the end of Division Avenue, maybe, you know, the developer could also invest in improving that street end area as well not just utilizing it as sewer and for sure groundwater treated discharge infrastructure. Um, so we are doing sidewalk uh, upgrades on our side of that. Yes, um, not in the roadbed though. Right, well, uh, what about the very, there's a, at the end of the roadbed, there's a whole section that's like a very large sidewalk area you know, I mean, it's something that we've talked about in many places, and there's been really great examples like the end of Manhattan Avenue and Greenpoint, where the city has invested, you know, in, in turning that place into an asset for the community. A lot of people gather there. And so, you know, something as simple as like planters or, you know, trees or whatever, you might be limited with trees with the CSO there, but, you know, planters, benches, something like that that would, you know, again, provide some benefit. 
website and just fresh pavement there on your side. There is a connection the to the. I'm sorry, Willis. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, it's okay. There, there is a connection to the. I would say, quite large park component that we were at the waterfront committee previously before. So, that not only are we uh, upgrading that sidewalk, um, but also connecting to the park there. The I think the pieces that you're talking at are not under our control. So certainly this, the roadbed is, I believe, DOTs, uh, and the other section I think is a different parcel, so different ownership. I want to right. Say, I guess. Yeah. I was to say, Willis. I want to say on West Street, one of the, along with the developments, I want to say maybe Huron. Um, DEC actually, I think, is together with the developer, um, you know, creating some sort of, you know, soft, you know, soft open space that's connecting to the developer's access, waterfront uh, access area. So I just, yeah, seems like there's potential there. You know, it's a you know, great little pocket at division. Yeah, totally. I mean, I just, I feel like, uh, you know, Unfortunately, the city is not investing resources uh, where it should be in, in these opportunities. And, you know, we've been let, you know, it's part of the remnants of the 2005 rezoning that the major commitments by the city have still been unfulfilled in terms of open space. And, you know, we've been looking to developers to step up and, and help generate benefit for the community. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot, a lot of benefit for the developer and everything that's happened to the neighborhood and the value of the land and the, how much you can rent apartments for. So why not invest a little bit and reach out to DOT and say, hey, we wanna beautify this street and put in some planters and some benches and you know, take on a maintenance as an extension of the larger promenade. Is there a cost to the developer for using the, the CSO for the, the draining of the water? Is, are you paying the city for that, or is that is that just something the city provides? There will be a permit fee to DEC, and and similarly for other projects that connect to DEP, there is also a permit fee requirement based on the volume. That's correct. Uh, and I I know that the goal is those portions that you were uh, referencing. Uh, well. It's I would say the the park component of the project that we have shown before is is a significant um, investment to the to the waterfront as a of a as a public park. Um, with, I think we showed this the last time. I won't go too far into it because we're here for the speedies. But uh, multiple points of access and entry to make sure that, and also the uh, uh, clear site corridors. Um, I'm the there's a central corridor that comes to mind between the two areas that we showed earlier, um, which is a substantial new connection to the waterfront as well. Where Where is that? Is that on di division or between? Um, Matt, if you can go back to the. Sure, one uh, moment. Please. The, it, it's not from division, Mr. Chair. It's it's um, from Kent uh, to the new waterfront public access. Okay. So it sort of runs, well, the central dotted line, but runs perpendicular not at an angle like that i don't i don't have an illustrative image here today that shows this but um essentially runs from where the pink and blue uh, uh converge straight to the water uh not at an angle displayed there but is that required or is that beyond what's required no that was that was design connection we wanted to to create so that there was now access directly yeah Exactly, Matt's Matt's drawing. Thank you, Matt. But is that a is that is that a zoning requirement to have an upland connector? Nope, it's additional. Additional, okay. And uh, just off the top of your head, across a division, is that property five hundred Kent? You know, is that? Um... I think so. Yeah, that's not our site. Right, right. So that's I think going to be an office building development. Just wondering if somehow. Yeah, the two developers to you know benefit themselves further could help you know just creating a bit more green space, which also be you know benefit to the tenants of you know 470 as well. So because um, yeah, we need every inch of open space that we can get, and 
good quality. Um, I just don't, yeah, what Willis said, it was just, we had the most housing units built in the decade between 10, 2010 and 2020, um, 20,000 20, and counting. So, um, all right, so um, I don't know, maybe, maybe inter we'll see if there's any other comments or questions, if Willis mm -hmm. had any more um, to add on this. Steve? <laughs> Steve, it's Eric. Hi, hey, Eric. Hey, uh, Willis, um, maybe we should talk about this division thing uh, at uh, Transportation Committee and New Business. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Sounds good, Eric. Okay, um, anyone else? Okay. I guess that that's it. Um, yeah, thanks very much again for coming in the presentation and discussing this with us. Um, yeah, it's just good to know that for us, I think the committee to uh, connect with um, one of these processes that's happening on the waterfront here, so. Um, thank, thank you for the opportunity and we'll we'll follow up on the items we said we would. Yep. Great, I appreciate that, thanks. Okay, um, have a good one, Mr. Chair. Moving on to item two, which is 566, 568 Grand Street Superfund site through DEC. Um, oh, um, Matt, if you're still here, can you un? Oh, it's Sadiq. Never mind. Sorry, he's right on that. Um, so Sadiq, we have uh, Rodney's here from DEC as well. Are there any other? Um, folks here, either from environmental community or developer? Yeah, this is Tony Prada from New York State DOH. I'm the project right. manager for DOH. Oh, great, thank you for coming. And uh, Bill, Bill Bennett is on, I'm uh, Sadiq's uh, section chief. Okay. All right, so yeah, if you could, um, uh, go ahead, you know, uh, give your presentation and as we've done in the past, then field questions and comments from the committee and then um, the general public. And um, so if you would, uh, um, fire away. Sadi, are you, uh, maybe you're muted? I don't know if you're trying to speak, but we can't we can't hear anything from you. Can you hear me? Okay, now we hear you. There we go. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, I made it was unmuted in the screen. So you can see my screen in the five sixty six, five sixty eight Grand Street. Yes. Can you see everyone? Hello? Yeah, what was that second yes. question? Yeah, the question is that I'm, yeah. okay. So in the screen, I'm showing the presentation of the site, which you are going to discuss today. The yes. site name is 566, 568 Granny Street, and site number is 224356, and located in Brooklyn, Kings County. Um, next. Okay. Oh. Okay. So meeting summary. Um, we are going to discuss about the state superfund program, 566-568 Grand Street site, uh, site characterization report for the site, and interim remedial measure, RM work plan for the site, citizens participation, and questions and comments later. So, state superfund program. Under environmental conservation law, ECL, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation investigates all suspected or known in inactive hazardous waste disposal sites. The DEC 
notifies identified property owners if a property is considered a potential inactive hazardous waste disposal site. Upon DEC notification, site owners may conduct a remedial program for the site under a consent order in the state super fund program and in accordance with DEC's technical requirements. For this site, the owner signed a consent order which was executed on April 5th, 2022. And the previous investigation showed for this site that correlated volatile organic compound, CVOCs, contamination in soil vapor exists on the site. And historic need of the site as a dry cleaner, and site consists of tax map parcel block 2785 and lot 27. Actually, lot 27 and 22, but uh, later in 2021, the applicant uh, merged the two lot, and now it is both lot become only one lot, lot 27. Remedial party site owner is Grand Street SPE LLC, and consent order executed on April 6th. 2022, and we received the site characterization report, and also we received the interim remedial measure work plan, which is submitted by the consultant. And this is the aerial view of the site. You can see 566 and 568 guys this side here. So one side is empty, which is uh, block 27, and another side has got a uh, um, partial building, that is the lot 28. And now we can load 27. This is the real view of the site. Just showing. And site description location. Uh, it is a 0 0.870 acre property in Williams Park section. It's actually 0.087. That's a typo. <laughs> it's a little smaller than that. Oh, it's supposed to be? Yeah, it's 0.087. Oh, sorry, 0 0.87. Sorry. Yeah. And tax map is blog 2785. And lot 27, current use site is vacant. Historical use was a store, residential, commercial, and dry cleaning shop. And site uh, area is zone R7A slash C24, residential and commercial. Proposed redevelopment um, will be eight story mixed use commercial and residential. So in both parties, a remedial regulation, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Public Health Regulation, New York State Department of Health, and applicant 566 Granny Steel SP LLC, and engineering consultant, Envirotech, Environmental Engineering and Geology, DPC. And site correction report. Based on previous site investigation conducted between 2017 and 2021, site soils contain semi-volatile organic compounds, SVOCs, and metals over restricted residential soil cleanup objectives. Site groundwater contains correlated volatile organic compounds, CVOCs, over groundwater standards. And soil vapor intrusion sampling in former on-site building indicated levels of CVOCs in soil vapor, which warrant soil vapor intrusion mitigation. And for this site, the off-site soil vapor intrusion investigation will be required. In given remedial measure work plan, uh, based on the IRM work plan, uh, the applicant proposed excavation and off-site disposal of contaminated soil to varying depths between three to 18 feet below the surface grade across most of the site to remove soil above restricted residential issues. Uh, import, import and clean material that meets the established soil cleanup objectives for use as a backfill. And installation of a subslab deposition system to address the soil vapor intrusion impacts in the new building. Installation of site cover meeting restricted residential soil cleanup objectives as part of site development. The IRM work plan is currently subject to 30-day public comment period, which will end on May 8, 
2022. And from the RM work plan, this is the figure showing uh, varying depth to throughout the site during the RM implementation. So this area will be, um, they dig out around like eight feet, and the yellow area will be the elevator pit, maximum depth will be 18 feet, and the pink area would be throughout the pink area with 13 feet. These are the different, uh, so the site, they will dig out different based on the contamination they found in the site condition report. They are, they are planning to dig out most of the soil um, to have the um, restricted soil clean of the team meet that team, uh, that one. And the new building will have a satchel depreciation system. This is the, under the slab. This red line perforated pipe will be um, implemented, uh, will be built under the slab, uh, to, which will be under uh, vacuum pressure using a blower and take out whatever the remaining soil vapor under the in the soil that can be taken out so, so that it can go into the basement of the building or the first floor of the building. So this will be implement during the implementation of the building. And citizen participation, near this involves the public to improve the process of investigating and cleaning of contaminated sites, enable citizens to participate more fully in decisions that affect their health environment, and social well-being. Fact sheets help the public to understand contamination issue related to a site and the nature and progress of efforts to investigate and clean up a site. And citizen participation, to receive future fact sheet, uh, everyone can sign up for email notice through DC Delivers. This is the link, uh, you can, anybody can sign up and using this link, and they can automatically receive the fact sheet when the department will release the fact sheet for site related for this site. And search on DC's website for DC delivers and access to fact sheets, work plans, reports, and other project documents online to DC info locator. This is the link anybody can use to see site specific site question report. Any, any documents like fact sheet, work plan, or um, RM work plan, FER, site management plan, whatever is there, document everything public can review using this link. And for this site, uh, Jim, we got two document repositories. One is Brooklyn Community Board 1, and another is Brooklyn Public Library Lunar District Branch. So this depository is supposed to get all the documents, either hard copy or electronic copy. And this is the presentation I am giving by Mayam Sadigraman, project manager from New York State DC for the site. And Anthony Parata is the New York, uh, New York State UHPM. He also joined the meeting. So now, if you have any questions, we can discuss about this. Okay. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Sadiq, for, for that presentation. So, you could mm -hmm. first, could you go back to slide eight for a second? Okay. Um, I just wanted to be clear soil vapor intrusion sampling and former on site building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. This one actually, what happened? They did the investigation on the soil vapor intrusion investigation which means they collected soil vapor from the basement uh, indoor and uh, six inch below the basement slab. And the, the soil vapor result, lab results, they compared with the soil vapor, the near DOH soil vapor matrix, yeah, intuition evaluation matrix, A and B, C, there are the three matrices. Um, Anthony can clearly mention about that, uh, discuss about that. Based on the matrix, what about the contamination we saw with, uh, from that uh, uh, data? It looks that that building needs mitigation based on that. So very high contamination in the basement and also on the uh, indoor air. So that means that there are soil vapor issues on site. 
So that building at that moment need mitigation. But now since the building will be gone, they are going to uh, do the, uh, the they'll install, uh, redevelop the site with a two new building. They will take out the soil, and definitely they will take out the endpoint soil samples. We will check the and send the lab for the result. What is there any remaining impacts we can see? But more of uh, they're supposed to clean all the soils, and mm -hmm. definitely they will put the subsurface repairs system and soil vapor barrier for the new building. So have you um, have you um, tested for vapor intrusion on uh, neighboring properties? Yeah, that's I mentioned that offset soil vapor intrusion investigation will be required. So since this site came to the program recently. Um, you know, we'll develop, they will going to submit in another work plan for the HVA evaluation for the neighbor adjacent property. Based on that, hopefully we have not received that one. We'll receive very soon. And that uh, work plan will mention that which neighboring property they are going to go there and get the such lab and indoor sample from those adjacent properties to see uh, if there are any impacts there. Okay. So, uh, so. The, the existing contamination, do you, uh, are basically, is it seems safe to say that it's it basically originated on this property or did it potentially migrate um, from neighboring properties <laughs> and, and, vice, and vice versa? Uh, the worry yeah, of this thing, you know. Yeah, this one actually site has got um, a one time, the history of the site is was a dry clearing facility. So mm -hmm. generally dry clearing facility is the PC, the tetrachloroethylene, uh, or the TC, which is the um, uh, solvent for cleaning the clothes. So mm -hmm. at that time, maybe accidentally or some um, like poor housekeeping, they may release some PC on the soil or the ground um, or in the floor, which may eventually reach to the groundwater through the soil. So there is a chance that it could be the site. And also, as we saw, the opposite side of the uh, Grand Estate, there is the 555 Grand Estate, there is the BCP side. I know when we uh, they came to the program, the, under that program, we know we need to do um, adjacent properties, the uh, uh, soil vapor induction uh, evaluation, which mm -hmm. is not done yet, but we are planning to do that too. Okay, so, are you are you treating the groundwater as well? In addition no, to the the groundwater, we are not treating at this time because contaminant um, right now we are not treating because based on the contamination, what we found, uh, we don't have any plan for the groundwater treatment right now. The, the levels of uh, uh, groundwater contamination were not far over the, the groundwater standards. Um, the groundwater is at 25 feet, and there's no use of groundwater, uh, you know, in, in in the city or in this area. Um, so, um, I mean, this is an IRM. Um, I mean, the goal of the IRM is for for no further action after the IRM. But um, there's there's a limited amount that can be done for groundwater with that marginal of uh, contamination um, and at that depth. Um, there's there's just a limited amount of a, a Remedies that are that, that are effective on that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in terms of the extent of the contamination, what elevated it beyond brownfield status into superfund status? Um, well, it's it's not it's not really um, it, it it was eligible for the brownfield program, um, but uh, they chose to uh, their their choice was to enter the superfund program instead. And is there a benefit for to them doing that? Um, well, it, it uh, I mean, for this particular site, uh, there was concern with the Brownfield program. Uh, the, the, um, they um, they wanted to do their development more quickly than the Brownfield program would allow. Um, so their their choice was to uh, the, the, that um, the uh, Superfund program offered them the opportunity to uh, proceed with their development more quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of the things. So, can you reiterate what the 
projected start date is for this interim uh, remediation and the length of that. I that slide went by very quickly. Um, there are plans to uh, start the IRM in, in May um, and um, in, intend to have um, part of their foundation and you know essentially by uh, June fifteenth. Um, I see to yeah. get under grandfather the four twenty one a. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. All right. Um, that's it for me for now. Um, any uh, committee members have questions or comments for Sadiq, William, or Anthony? Yes, I, I do. Uh, um, okay. Specifically, what metals were found? I, I see that it's uh, SVOCs and metals. Can you go to uh, slide seven, 17, Sadiq? We, 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 uh, the, the figures are hard to see, so we didn't include them in the presentation, but we've got a little supplemental material with some specifics. I think it's 17. Yeah, okay. It's really yeah. I, think, I think it's okay. lead. Um, lead, mercury, lead and mercury. Mm. In, the, in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, it's just the one sample. Have lead and mercury. It's very, it's lead, very small, lead, so I can't see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to zoom in there on S SB five uh, in the corner? Yes, sir. I, I was trying to let me see. And it's hard with the presentation. Is it going to the uh, yeah the presentation mode or the slide show mode? Yeah, make it, it a little bigger. Uh, it is now in presentation mode. Uh, okay. Layout page uh, research feed. And I can uh, so is all will that be excavated and replaced with clean fill? A part of that? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can I can pull the numbers up here. Um, and actually I'm seeing the pesticides here now too. Um and I can't see the the name of the pesticides that were found. Uh, those are actually uh, yeah, it, it's a DDD, 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 DDT, and DDE, but DDD, they're actually DDD. below the restricted residential standard. The uh, restricted residential standard is denoted by a different color. Um, yeah. The uh, and those are blue and the yellow. Yeah. Blue and the yellow. Um, the top lead concentration is 1,320 parts per million. And Mercury is at 16 parts per million. They were only found in the one sample. Um, SB5 at 2 to 4 feet. Um, oh, mercury was also at SB2 at 2.37 parts per million at 10 to 12 feet. I mean, the, the, uh, the PAHs and the metals here are, are pretty typical for, a, for an urban fill um, that can be found at you know, many properties around the city. Um, Thank you. Anyone else from committee? Um, Eric, I guess your hand was still raised from before. <laughs> um, all right, um, in terms of. Uh, yeah, sorry, Steve. That's all right. Uh, communicating with properties in proximity, you know, uh, adjacent or in pro close proximity, what is the, the process for notifying them about this, um, this cleanup program? Yeah, generally once we, we select the uh, houses when they're going to do the sampling, um, um, applicant will cater for the access permission. So owners are supposed to give the access permission to implement that is the evolution study. Okay, I'm sorry, you you, uh, you kind of garbled out there in the beginning. Um, so we are actually, when we will decide that which building will be doing the evaluation, the applicant or the department will keep send a letter for the access request. So owner of the adjacent property was supposed to give the access to the applicant to implement the uh, soil vapor inclusion study. Did you get the actual notice or a letter? Or a, I'm, yeah, letter. 
to the adjacent property owner. Okay. Yeah, the the uh, remedial party has agreed to do that investigation. They they agreed this week uh, based on comments on the site characterization report. So they should be submitting a work plan soon. And um, you know, based on that, we'll we'll decide uh, with them what what uh, how far the extent is going to be required. Probably at, at first it would just be the immediately adjacent properties. And based on that, there'll, there'll be letters sent uh, to to uh, request access and uh, you know follow up if necessary. Steve, just to be clear, they got the property owner has to give permission um, for the sampling to be done. Right, understand. Thank you. Permission. Yep. Yeah, I guess the reason I ask, I mean, is you know, just worried. You know, this is whether you know it's a brownfield or a super fund. Um, just that you know, soil vapor contamination. Um. Just where you know migrating to these other properties that look like you know residences. Um, the uh, with the pressurization system, so is that essentially going to uh, be ventilated through the roof somehow, or you know, or dispersed through the roof, or how does that work? You want to answer that one, Bill? <laughs> or no, it's a, well, I, yeah, I would, I, um, I, I believe it, it, it is. I, I don't have the plans right in front of me, but that, that's what typically is done. Is that the, the, vent, the venting runs through the building up and out, up through the roof. Um, and it, yeah, when, when, it, when it is uh, released at the roof level, it's, it, and it volatilizes quickly and uh, uh, dissipates so that it, the uh, levels are would not be a concern to uh, passersby. Okay. All right. Um, anyone else from the committee or from the general public? Yes, I have another question. Okay. Um, I, I know you said that the uh, the property owners will get um, notification, but are they under an obligation to inform their tenants who will be uh, notifying tenants? Well, oh. At present, there's no. I, I don't think there's any buildings at the site. That one building that that was there, that the sampling required. There's a sampling indicated mitigation required. That the building was already taken down. Um, so for the new building, uh, there would be a subslab pressurization system, and that should uh, there'll be verification testing uh, before that building is occupied to make sure that system is working, um, and then operation and maintenance of that system uh, in perpetuity. Um, so the the uh, you know there there's no current exposure and when the when the new building comes in and, and, and tenants come in, there will be a system in place that will prevent exposures. And, and that's going to prevent exposures to uh, other buildings even across the street and so forth. No, the the other buildings need to be investigated to determine if uh, mitigation is needed. And so that that process is going to start in, within the next few months. But what I'm saying is, that, you know, I think you're talking about the immediate building. I'm talking about mm -hmm. the, na uh, the tenants and neighbors in other buildings, you know, on <laughs> in that area on the block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that well, they will. I mean, there there will be notices that they're, they're, we'll send letters out to each of the of the property owners. Um, Yes, that's yeah, what oh, I, I see what you're saying. The, the uh, so the the, uh, my, my understanding yeah. is that yeah. the property owners are under no obligation to inform the tenants. So how are the tenants going to be finding out about this? Mm. Tony, do you know what, what we do in that once, situation? Yeah. Once the sampling's completed, once we have access and we go in and well, we sample, no, then, there, yeah. then for soil vapor intrusion specifically, there is a tenant notification law that states okay. that, the, that the owner has to notify the tenants. Um, and I don't recall off the top of my head what the timetable is for that, but after the sampling is completed, uh, the data that we collect goes to a third party data validator who reviews the data and confirms that it's valid. And once that's done, the clock starts ticking and they have to have, a, they have to notify the tenants of the building. Um, 
that's that's a state law um, that I believe came in under Patterson. And um, who follows up to make sure to make sure that actually happened? Because I, I know that there's a difference between requirements and making sure that it actually happens. I think we would. I, we I would just have concerns for, uh, about the residents. Yeah, I think on, we, we would ask for, for proof that the notifications were were made, and if they weren't made, then we'd make the notifications ourselves. And we typically ask for the letters that they're going to send uh, yeah. to the property owners, so that we know that, so we see what they're going to say, um, and we can we can tweak them a little bit here and there just to make sure that they make sense and that you know anybody can understand them um, because sometimes like I say I get my geek on and it's just because I've been doing this stuff for a long time and I forget that even talking to my wife she doesn't understand <laughs> what I'm talking about sometimes so uh, we try to we try to get the letters to a level where people understand what what it says and if there's an issue we inform them how it's going to be addressed um, as time progresses and would the uh, remediation and in, in if there was an issue, an issue where they needed to be mitigated um, when the system would be installed and stuff like that, that should be, all, you know, that would be all in that letter um, that the property owner has to provide to or, or notification the property owner should provide to his tenants. Okay, thank you. And there's no um, protocol where these notices are sent directly to the tenants themselves? Not that I'm aware of, no. It's, it goes through the property owner to the tenants. And that's environmental conservation law that they have to provide the uh, information to the tenants, so. Got it, okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, um, I think that that's it. Um, thank you very much for coming in, presenting, and discussing this project. Um, I just found it just interesting that the uh, owner, to you know, to benefit his development plans, can opt for, you know, a for Superfund program versus Brownfield to. Um, um, well, they have to do the same cleanup under the Superfund program that they would under yeah. the Brownfield program, and they just don't get tax credits. So, uh, okay. um, yeah, it's. Uh, but in this case, that was what the uh, the and um, you know they were they were willing to uh, to to address this site in a timely manner. So, um, right. yeah, that's that's not always the case. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, hey, uh, thanks again. And thank you. Um, Thanks for having us. I think uh, Sadiq, I think you did send the presentation to the board, right? Uh, the file. Um, so I just forward to you, no problem. Yeah, if not, if you could, that would that would we appreciate that to include in our okay. report. Sure, right. I'll do that. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, committee members, do we? Uh, is there anything you feel like uh, we might want to comment, submit a um, comment on? Recommend submitting to DEC. Um, or do you feel like they, you know, they got got the message, you know, any message that we were trying to convey to them? <laughs> I mean, it's just. You know, just kind of a repeat of other projects that we've had where it's just, you know, they can't, you know, we didn't even go there, but they can't post remediation contact information on the site. And at the ideal world, they should just send the notices to anyone who lives nearby or works nearby or has a business nearby and deliver them. You know? um, so, um, all right, so I think maybe plus folks um, are really worried. I guess we'll just uh, I'll submit our report. 
Um, and then just in terms of um, updates, a couple items that came through the board in the last couple of weeks. Um, one of them was the, uh, I guess called the tenant, tenant association at uh, five bell slip. I wrote a letter to the property, to the management company, but they also, they CC the board and they had a myriad of, of quality of life issues affecting them basically, you know, the state of the playground across the street. Uh, but that's for the parks committee to potentially address, but they're more worried about how the um, demolition remediation of the new heart building across the street would potentially affect their uh, the drinking water in their building and in the playground. Um, and we connected with Jane O'Connell from DEC and Ashley Thompson, a representative of the developers. And um, uh, Jane basically said, basically what she's, you know, the, there was a community me a meeting held, I guess about a month and a half, two months ago through NBN that, you know, the, all the, you know, water used to shower and drink and so forth um, goes through, you know, a conduit system and the glooms at the new heart site are, you know, basically, you know, below that, though I, I know the T, the, TCE plume is, you know, it's permeating the, uh, it's, uh, in the you know, uh, through vapor. Um, but, um, but I don't, you know, the question is, do we want to try and, um, you know, uh, mediate a conversation with these tenants and the agencies and developer, like next month, you know, bring in, have them talk about it or potentially just have, you know, a council member wrestler and assembly member Gallagher deal with it. But, you know, they, uh, Deborah Scott was the person they specifically addressed community board one. What about NBN? Are they following up as well with it? Um, I don't know if they were included um, in the correspondence. I feel like it's, it, I mean, it, it depends on you, but I feel like it could be, this could be a, a form to bring them. Um, Cause it, it was, was it the last meeting or maybe two environmental protection committee meetings ago where they presented? Um, I know that we had sent that letter about asking them to monitor the air at least. I don't know. I, I don't know if you've heard anything. I don't know if they ever responded well, or that if was, I think uh, Greenpoint Landing 16 <clears throat> DuPont Street. Um, I think, and yeah, <clears throat> Jane, <clears throat> so they had a project manager, uh, I think it was Zach um, Schreiber, is that his last name? But Jane was here also just in case we had questions about how it might affect Newhart. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it could be an opportunity just to, um, to address that issue. Because um, I know that I've been running into people who live at Blue Slip or, or parents because, you know, Mike, I have a concern about Greenpoint Playground, I mean, and not just Newhart, but also the Greenpoint Landing, you know, on um, both of them at the same time, having that ac activity. Um, so, and, and, and it seems to me that they were totally kind of unaware of what was happening. Right. Um, they kind of it, it got a sense of increased activity, but as as tenants didn't know what was going on or certainly didn't know uh you know with small children the potential impact so i think as much awareness as possible but sorry steve so did they um did they respond that they were going to be monitoring that's what's a little unclear to me um, um yeah i think i believe they did i have to double check but i believe they responded that they monitor error at the you know at the playground is that if you invite them back, that could be a good chance for them to report on the data that they're collecting. Mm, yeah. Because <laughs> monitoring is really... one thing, communicating the results is another. That's right. Yeah, I could, I see, definitely see the merits of that. 
Others, others agree, disagree. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll work with um, the board to see if we can get something in like the first week of June, the first couple of days of June, because the full board meeting got pushed up to uh, June seventh, I think. So um, so we'll get right on that. All right. Uh, the other item was um, is National Grid, their new fossil fuel free campaign uh, that they're having a marketing uh, blitzkrieg going on right now. And I know no North Brooklyn Pipeline sent a statement to the board, just kind of um, undoing a lot of what you know the National Grid's assertions, mainly around utilizing um, you know natural gas that is generated from you know solid waste that is being processed at the treatment plant. Um, but that they are, if I understand, they are supposed to implement, and it's I think roughly ten years behind schedule and counting. Um, utilizing you know, this um, green hydrogen, I guess, through their, I guess, existing natural gas infrastructure underground. I know they, when they were pressed at the CUNY board about their pipeline project and vaporizers, we were saying, hey, you know, climate change is now, and you guys are way behind, you know, the curve. So here it is. But um, I don't know. I just, I feel like that's, there's so many other ways I feel like the city can adapt to the climate crisis in terms of residential and uh, building ownership and businesses. Um, so, so I'm trying to think the best way to address that. I know no, no North Brooklyn pipeline want us immediately make a statement, but I remind them that you know we're a legislative body and we can't just you know send stuff out. Um, if maybe at that same meeting we want to discuss that formally, uh, because you know it's sure you know it's a citywide issue, a statewide issue, but obviously we have this infrastructure that is being developed and exists in our neighborhood and our legacy pollution here, and being surrounded by to a great extent by water. Um, so how you guys feel like we want to. Um, take a uh, you know a, a deeper dive into their their plan. Um, they bring in some expertise on their initiatives, especially the green hydrogen. I think we should. Here in North Brooklyn, as everybody knows, we've been suffering from man-made pollution for over a hundred years, and we should take the leadership for the city. I think that we should be you know, leading the charge. Thank you. Um, so I think if we, you know, should we, you know, invite national grid in and just get the, yeah, uh, have them try and prove, prove their point, or should we just, you know, respond on the merits of what they said and said, just go through the various, um, assertions that they made. Um, Steve, yeah, okay. let them come and present. I mean, yeah. if, uh. You know, just to put them on notice that we're paying attention and we're and there's plenty of substantive questions that this committee could put forward to them that uh yeah. you know, and they love to come and get tortured by us, so let them come. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and also Steve, we know groups that are fair and but are experts on this field to um, um to let them know about the meeting so we can have some more uh, expertise response. Okay. Great. All right. Folks feeling okay about that or not? Do we want to present them with questions that we want answered? We could. Because if we're going to deal with new heart and that in the same night, you know, we want it to be succinct. Well, the other thing is they'll come with a presentation, a very empty, long presentation. But if we give, but 
which if we just ask them to come and present, that's what they'll do. But if we give them specific questions, we can mm -hmm. we'd like answers to A, B, C, D. Yeah. Sort of control it. That's good. And also hold some accountable to their um, response. And maybe uh, DEP should be present also to answer questions about um, the goings on at the plant. Or the also, lack of. It's also regulated by the state, so you also have to have the state as well, the EC. Sounds like a whole night. I almost want that almost um, could use its own um, night, you know, hearing because, because yeah, there's a lot going on there. And then another thing I want to ask about is um, a lot of uh, May Willis and Laura. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I periodically attend the the Newtown Creek CAG meetings. And I seem to remember a number of months back. There's a particular as far as the super fun. Um, program, there's an there's an OU where National Grid is operating, and there's an on basically an ongoing leak, if I understand correctly, but somehow they're they're not um, I don't know somehow they're distancing some them distancing themselves from this whole feasibility study pro, you know formulation process. Um, are they even a responsible party right now? Potential sponsoring party. They they are still a, a PRP of the Superfund process. Um, I'm not sure specifically what you're referring to, Steve. The in terms of like sep separate units as part of the Superfund, none of it is specific to National Grid. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of concern about the contamination that is um, at their site and potentially migrating and EPA hasn't really definitively or to receive proven if there is or is not migration from their site in Greenpoint into the creek. I see. All right. Well, that sounds like something is um, leave to the CAG to work out right now. Um, but I yeah, feel like I if, mean, you know, if we need to, you know, to shake that tree, we could try and do that here as well. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm just worried if we have New Heart and Natural Grid in the same night, that could be one of our, you know, another, going back to the marathon committee meetings. Um, so anyone speak, I don't know the timing of dealing with that right now, because of, you know, there's the, um, you know, there's a state process going on right now, I guess, related to, um, you know, adherence to the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And somehow the National Grid is somehow trying to, you know, weaken what's going on. So the timing would. Um, so we outreached to Emily Gallagher, our state assembly person. Uh, I think she was. Uh, Willis would know more about this to give us the climate uh, as far as what uh, Steve is talking about. Hmm. I mean, sort of updates on the CPCLA or? Yeah, if there's any deadlines we should know about uh, instead of always in you know, the 12th hour. So we could be a little bit proactive. Well, I guess the reason I'm asking is, you know, we basically have one more meeting left until September. Um, so if we, like, you know, the new hard demo, you know, the Eastern portion is happening right now. So I think it would just be important if we're going to have, you know, a committee, um, address this, that that happen, you know, as soon as we can, but this, you know, if national grid and, you know, this climate act, if there's issues with that right now, also. I mean, theoretically, if we, you know, just nail it down and say, we're going to just. A lot an hour to issue 1 and an hour to issue 2. Um, you know, we could be out by 9. Um, but I just feel like, 
<laughs> I think we did pretty, actually pretty well. The National Time we had National Grid in, we had num numerous issues on the docket and thought we got through it pretty quickly, but um, could give it a shot. We should okay. set the challenge. Let's just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Who goes first? <laughs> I think we should make sure that the, those tenants are taken care of, you know. Um, so maybe we'll go to New Hart first and the National Grid second. I mean, I mean either either way would work, but I feel like the tenants, you know, you know being mindful of you know, families, you know, um, some folks have trouble staying connected uh, beyond a couple hours, you know. So, um, but yeah, okay. So maybe we'll we'll, we'll shoot for, to get get them both in here. So we'll get that going. Um, any, uh, yeah. Speaking of the um, the treatment plant, the you know Nick Mick, you know the the the, mo the monitoring committee. Remember way back when we, you know, we wrote a letter asking to either reestablish funding or enhance the funding and then kind of got pushed back. Well, there isn't really need and it's, and I guess I'm confused because there, there is, the committee still exists in some form and it is meeting, but does it just need more funding, need more teeth? I mean, what, what is, you know? Um, he, yeah, he's I, been, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Laura. Is the DEP has just been very resistant all along on having uh, ha having the com the committee, you know, be active, you know, until the very end. Um, there's still, I mean, there's still a couple of, um, I guess we call it milestones that they have to fulfill um, before you know, before they consider us like a defunct group, so we've been wanting to keep it alive um, because they, you know, a lot, a lot is still going on at the plant. There's still a lot of uh, things that are going to cause emissions and um, you know breakdown of the uh, the system that we we kind of knew about all along. Is that fair, Will? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And I was I was also gonna say that um, council member Ressler's office has been in communication with DEP about ways to more formally sort of reinstate uh, Nick Mick. And so the latest that we have heard is that basically, you know, if, focuses less on funding for an outside liaison. And it's more about just DEP committing to have regular meetings with the committee and, and, a, and having a point person at DEP because there are, as Laura mentioned, I mean, there's ongoing issues. Um, I mean, mainly the, the natural gas project and being over six years behind schedule at this point. So um, we're sort of waiting for Lincoln's office to, to, I don't know, I guess hear back from DEP, but they, they seem very committed to to pushing forward for this. Okay. Reinstating the committee. Okay. So you just um, they request that the council member keep us updated, you know, at the, at the board here. Okay. All right. And um, I don't know any, um, Willis, any? Anything to update as far as the creek is going or anything else uh, <coughs> NCA is dealing with there? No, I mean, I think that you you were at the last CAG meeting. I mean, the, the biggest development is a potential reauthorization, deauthorization of the depths of the creek, which will, you know, have potential impacts, you know, both good and bad, it, could, it will allow for for salt marsh restoration and the upper tributaries has been a long sort of sought goal of the community, but it may also allow for the responsible parties to do a, a less significant dredging. And so, you know, the cat, we're still sort of, I think, figuring out how to approach this because there's aspects I think we want to be supportive of, but we also want to make sure that we 
get the, the you know, thorough cleanup that we've been demanding for so long. So that's really only the, the main right. update um, to the fund wise. Right. So le less dredging means less of a investment financially from these responsible parties? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, my take on it was that it, there would be more of a chance of just capping, which is not the preferred cleanup. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think that can the um, the board play any role in terms of the. Uh, you know, super fun process of amplifying problems or daylighting issues or yeah um, i mean i think that like once the cag has a little bit of a more firm position or understanding mm -hmm. of the ramifications of the specifically this um the depths the the channel depths that you know having cb1 as well as the other community boards are around the creek also weigh in may be helpful. Um, and especially as we get further down the line and start talking about other, other you know, remediation options uh, around the creek as well. I mean, one thing that's, that's, you know, very significant for the community board and a different committee is that the, if, if the Army Corps is gonna move forward with the sea authorization, the Grand Street Bridge will not need to be an, an movable bridge because they're going to delist the other side of, of the East Branch tributary. So, you know, that that's a big uh, potential impact to like how they're going to design the bridge. Uh, the timing, anyways, it's a sort of different topic, but um, yeah, I think that like, you know, as, as the CAG, as they're saying the CAG is weighing in, like we certainly, you know, I know CV do a great job of attending those meetings, but you know, we're always happy. Other members of the CAG are happy to help further engage um, CB1 on it. So if they chose not to do any more extensive remediation, would it be just turned into a massive wetlands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, ideally there's, you know, the ideal scenario is that there's dredging, thorough dredging where there's high levels of contamination. And then in the upper tributaries, there's also dredging and then there's also marsh creation, you right. know, afterwards as well. So. Sounds good. Yeah, I really appreciate, you know, you guys are there in the trenches. Dealing with all that wonky, <laughs> all the wonkiness of those agencies and what they're bringing to the table there. Um, and so now we're for fortunate to have, have you guys. All right. Um, anybody have any other updates, issues? So, um, um, so got, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, sorry. I just had one other sort of brain of thought and it's like come up a lot in the past and, uh, I'm just thinking of it on the top of my mind now because I'm underneath the K bridge, but you know, the, in the past, like NCA and other groups had you know, push for better controls of uh, open industrial uses and the impacts on air quality. And, you know, there's a number of sort of sites that are still around in in CB1 where there's, you know, little to no control over, over uh, air quality and mitigation of dust and other particulate matter coming off of some of these, mostly like demolition or whatever C and D waste hauling sites. So I don't I mean it's probably too much to get this on the agenda, but um thinking of how we could better understand you know regulations that are put on these facilities and then how we could push for stronger measures in general. Just throwing it out there. Done in the context of the district needs right here. Um, so are we supposed to be coming up with district needs? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I think you can throw it in there. I mean, it's less of like a specific thing. Like, it, it's more. I, to me, it's more of a sort of like uh, either a enforcement or sort of like legislative change 
to put in better protections uh and less about like funding from the city or state per se but yeah like you know we should why not include that it's a need of the district's mm -hmm. better protections on air quality specifically from open industrial use sites well the other we... thing willis um is how how to also protect the businesses in a way as they're enforced so if you're at under the cambridge right now um because uh, i heard that because the grandfathering of some of those businesses like empire or city recycling like i actually heard empire is probably relocating because they can't afford the um improvements that are needed to make them up to code once the grandfathered you know exemptions are released and so you know i guess it's like maybe an evergreen conversation is how do we protect kind of right those sort of uses as eyes are put on those businesses yeah no totally i think yeah i'm all for better understanding too better understanding yeah what the regulations are, how we can um, communicate them, enforce them. It puts us in an awkward position, you know? Yeah, I mean, in summary, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, obviously we don't wanna, and so we want the businesses that are here to not be creating, you know, hazards. And so, yeah, what are, are there ways to better, I don't know, incentivize or allow businesses to, improve their operations. Well, do you want to try and have a hearing meeting about it in the fall? Maybe um, just to, yeah, you said, just put on the table what the regulations are. And, but also, I, I mean, just kind of get an overview of what we think may be in the air, right? We have an asphalt plant across the creek that, um, and yeah, all the, Recycling and waste waste stations and um, oil depots, truck traffic, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of what Katie's very familiar with the uh, the open open air uses where there's in some places they have mitigations in place. Sometimes those mitigations are good, and sometimes they're not. In other places, there's like not mitigation for the open facilities. Right. Okay. Um, all right. But um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, William. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, um, last Sunday, one of our neighbors is a professor, and she deals with in how to maximize agriculture in urban environments, uh, landscaping, and um. She formed me an invite last Sunday to a, work, a workshop she had with her students regarding Newtown Creek. They did a study. Um, so I just want to know, um, Willis, did you participate or know about these students that did a, uh, a study? And um, Willis still with us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, video is having trouble here. What was it? Sorry, what was the class? What was the school? No, it was, uh, it was, um, I got to get more information. I had too many meetings, but basically, they did uh, the, uh, the, on in City College last Sunday. They oh, were okay, providing yeah. the, the results of their research, and these were students, which I found fascinating. We had city students doing this type of research, so I wanted to make sure you were involved and yeah, maybe yeah. The, the full percent because we need to make sure we support the next generation that's going to look after everything. So uh, yeah, uh, for sure. We uh, there's a class at City College that we worked closely with we did a number of like tours with them and sat in on some reviews of their work it's a graduate landscaping class specifically that we've yeah, been working that sounds with. All right yeah and um and christine the professor yes yeah, she lives on she lives right here yep. yeah she's yeah. also a county committee member so yeah. uh, i was hoping that maybe we could invite them in, in the fall because we got pressing issues um um so that's what i wanted to outreach into uh, steve okay yeah, no, that's great. And there's some specific projects in there that are pretty interesting that I saw. Um, yeah, no, she is brilliant. I, I wish I could have made it, but I already had a prior commitment to Lincoln. So, yeah. we, you know, sometimes we, we all wish we could be twins, but it doesn't work out. So, yeah. Um, Trina, so glad you mentioned the district needs statement. 
Um, Jerry, could you provide um, some clarity on when, say, the people or like a committee could provide input um, to make suggested revisions to our district needs statement? Um, I understand there's- Gina is putting together a report on that. We've been working very close with her with the office this week, and I think you'll hear from her on Tuesday. Okay. But it just generally, is it something like in the fall that we- Probably around October-ish, yeah. But okay. you could feed into the committee now at any time. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Also, I just want to say, because Willis brought up the, the Grand Street Bridge, years ago, quite a few years ago, this, this board approved a fixed bridge for that location. It was one of those basket-handled bridges. So uh, stay tuned, because that meeting with the uh, DOT is going to be happening soon, I think on the 16th, but it hasn't been con confirmed yet. And they're going to meet with both the boards, with, with us and Board 5 in Queens. And if I could just follow up on that, uh, I had spoken to Claudette Workman, Deputy Borough Commissioner, uh, and since then there's been some confusion, which is what Jerry's talking about, but we were going to have them present at uh, the 23rd transportation committee meeting, but we're, I need to wait to see what Rhonda says to Jerry before we go forward with that. Okay. All right. Well, in light of that information, that could be some really interesting uh, summer beach reading is the district needs statement. And uh, um, just one other thing. So uh, on district needs, so Gina presented um, at the last transportation committee meeting um, because Ryan's been um, championing, changing that up. And uh, she gave a great presentation, uh, which is a fairly straightforward, you know, uh, PowerPoint, which I can, I can forward to you. It'll be part, well, it'll be part of my report, which will be okay. out. Um, so I encourage everybody to take a look at that. And Gina is really amazing at, um, getting back to folks about stuff and, and she's really into the work. So, uh, didn't she say yeah. that she's going to be going, giving that same presentation to all the committees? I think you um, got it first. Honestly, I don't remember if she said that offhand, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. She's really involved in it. That's great. That's really good to uh, hear, um, Eric. Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, um, I think it would be great if our committee provided input on that and updated the statement um, to, you know, dealing with climate issues, contamination, pollution issues, waste, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just on a Plant that in the back of your minds, and we'll try and remind people. But maybe thinking, you know, by September, maybe have some ideas for um, updating that text. So, okay. All right. Anything else, um, folks, want to bring up, talk about? Okay. Cool. So, um, yeah, I will we'll find out very soon if we can schedule a June meeting for to bring a national grid and deal with Newhart. Um, so, but anyway, hey, thanks everyone for coming out at full full uh, committee, which is awesome. Appreciate that. And 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 neighbors, please continue wear your masks. I have so many uh, neighbors right here that are quarantined. So, wear those masks, please. You know. I've I've fully recovered, but because of my age, I still feel it took me forever to get um, um, how can um, uh, how can I how can I say it? my legs back to normal. I was fatigued with my legs for the longest time. So, um, please take care of yourself. That's good. Thanks. Thanks, William. All right. Well, I guess that's a wrap. Um, thanks a lot, Jerry. Everyone have a have a great night. And happy Wednesday. <laughs>